This is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and we're preparing for a time of prayer. That's what we're going to do today. And I just want to walk through a meditation on a dramatic story in Mark chapter 9. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. I'm going to give you a timeline of this. Uh, Mark chapter 9. If you were to read, especially the Gospel of Mark, you'd see this trajectory of the book. Jesus' public ministry was about three years. And uh, the first, the majority of those three years, he's preaching, he's teaching. Uh, he is displaying his authority and his power over disease, sickness, the demonic realm, over nature. And the question in Mark is always, who is this? Who is this? Who is this? And in chapter 8, Jesus finally poses this question to his disciples. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and he said, you are the one. That's exactly what he meant. You are the Christ. Now, if you follow the, the, the direction of the gospel, it says this. As soon as they acknowledged who he was, Jesus then told them what he was there for. He said, the Son of Man is going to be delivered over to the chief priests and the elders. He will be rejected, suffer, and he will die. And from that point on, you can just follow the geography. Jesus heads south to Jerusalem. And the bulk of the Gospels are the final week, the Passion Week, which we're coming up on in a couple of weeks. Now, as soon as Peter acknowledged, he said, you're the one, chapter 9 begins this very interesting way. Jesus often went away to pray in the wee hours of the morning. This time, he takes three of them with him. Peter, James, and John. Which makes me think that what these three witnessed happened all the time. What's about to happen next happened all the time. It's just now three of these guys were there to see it. And God in his mercy wants to show them something. So they went up to the mountain to pray. We don't know how long they were there, but all of a sudden, Jesus' appearance changed before their eyes. It says that his clothes were as bright as lightning. Now think about that. How bright is that? You can't look at lightning. And they were absolutely terrified. And if that was not enough, there were two guys all of a sudden standing there as well. One was Moses, representing the law. The other one was Elijah, representing the witness of the prophets. The Old Testament law, the Old Testament prophets who were bearing witness to this one. And if you do the timeline, Moses was about 1,500 years before Christ. And Elijah was seven or 800 years before Christ. And these guys, disciples, were absolutely terrified. And Peter, not knowing what else to say, said, he blurted out this, oh, hey, this is great. Why don't we just stay here? This is like Somerset Beach Camp. Let's build a tent for Elijah, a tent for Moses, a tent for you, and let's just not leave here. And the scripture says he did not know what he was saying. And then a cloud, and oh, the other detail that Luke gives is that Elijah and Moses were talking with Jesus about his departure. Not his death, not his resurrection, but his departure, his ascension to return to the Father, which was soon to come. And his ascension, we're going to have Ascension Sunday a few weeks, where Jesus led captives in his, in his train and he gave gifts to the church. The ascension is what empowers the church to do ministry, which makes this story even more interesting. And so Peter blurted out this nonsense and then a cloud enveloped them. And they heard the same voice that was heard at the baptism of Christ at the beginning of his three years. Here's the beginning of his three years. Here's the ending of his three years. And the voice said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And that voice was not just for Peter, James, and John, but it's for us. He's the one. Listen to him. And by this time, it says the disciples were face down planted in the ground, absolutely terrified. And I don't know how long it was before they got up. It would, you know, the, the scriptures read like that. It could have been hours before they had the courage to lift their face. And when they did, they saw that it was just Jesus in them. And Jesus warned them, don't tell anybody what you saw. Pretty wild story. 
But I think God in his grace knew the disciples at this critical time when they were about to head to Jerusalem and it would be a very tense time with the rejection and the crucifixion and all that violence that these guys needed to know two things. And they didn't put two and two together right away. It took them a while to figure it out. But here's what they figured out. Later on, they figured out two things. Number one, Jesus existed before time. Moses, 1,500 years earlier. Elijah, 700 years earlier. If you remember in John Gospel chapter 8, Jesus said to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, Abraham was 2,200 years before Christ, before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. He used the word Yahweh, the unspeakable name of God, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And that, by the way, sealed his death sentence, if you didn't know. So number one, they realized... He existed before, before time. Here's the second thing they, they put together later on. They realized that his death, his horrible crucifixion at the hands of the Romans, his death was entirely voluntary because no human could lay a hand on God unless God let him do it. And that gave great direction and clarity and comfort to those disciples later on. If you read Peter's letters, he references, we saw his glory. Anyway, so the next day they come back down. You know, have you ever been to camp, all this glorious spiritual high, and then you have to come back? And that's what they had to do. And when they came back down off the mountain, they saw this huge crowd of people and a bunch of arguing. The disciples were there and all the chief priests were there. And Jesus walks up and says, what in the world is going on here? Kind of like a mother. What, you know, what is going on here? And a man stepped forward who had a little boy. He said, Rabbi, my son is all his life has had seizures a demon that's thrown him into the fire. I'm so desperate. I brought him to you, but you weren't here, so I brought him to your disciples hoping that you could help him, and they couldn't drive it out. They couldn't do it. And all these people are arguing, you know, chief priests saying, you can't, I don't know what they were arguing about. And here Jesus gives a very interesting response, really unique in the Gospels, the first time you really see it. He's ticked off. And he said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long do I have to put up with you? How long do I need to stay with you? I don't know, what he was, I don't know who he was perturbed with. I'm not sure. If anybody knows, just email me this week. The evidence is he was upset with the disciples, their lack of faith. But yet, who could be upset with them, you know? Maybe he was upset with the chief priests and their callousness. Maybe upset with the father. I don't know. But I'll tell you, last week I was reading that line and I crossed out, oh, unrighteous generation, and I wrote my own name there. Oh, faithless Mark. How long do I need to put up with you? How long should I stay with you? Put your own name there. See how it reads. The crowd started coming and Jesus asked the father, how long has he been like this? And the father, as soon as that, by the way, that boy, as soon as the demon in that boy saw Jesus, the demon went into convulsions, threw the boy to the ground. He said, how long has he been like this? Father says, since birth. And the father said, oh, if you can, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus still has that edge to his voice. He says, if you can, everything's possible for those who believe. And then the father said, and this is the key to what I want to share with you. He looked at Jesus in an all earnestness, in all desperation. He said, oh, I believe. Help my unbelief. Doesn't that Father speak for all of us? Isn't that all of us? I believe. Oh, help my unbelief. Like we have one toe in the faith, and, but we live in another toe within the world that we live in.
Jesus took the boy and with a word, I love this part, he just very adamantly commanded that demon. He said, get out and don't come back. <laughs> Sounded like my mother. Actually, it sounded like my friend Bob Beardsley's mother when I was messing up at his house. <laughs> she said, you get out of this house and don't come back. The demon left. The boy fell. Look at corpse. They thought he was dead. Jesus grabbed him by the hand and stood him up and gave him back to the father. And they went privately into a room and the disciples asked Jesus, how come we couldn't fix this? How come we couldn't drive it out? And Jesus, very interesting response. He said, this kind can only come out by prayer. So I read that story, very interesting story. And I'm looking at the story and I'm thinking, but wait a minute, where's the prayer in the story? Nobody prayed, Jesus didn't pray. Of course, he's God. And then I look closer and I see the father's words, the desperate father, do you see the prayer? I believe, help my unbelief. Ole Hollisby wrote a classic book on prayer. We had our prayer summit here a few weeks ago. Oh, what a powerful time that was. I've been studying prayer, but I got a hold of this classic. Classic Hollisby, the book's prayer. His first chapter, he talks, he defines what prayer is. He says this, prayer is the expression of our helplessness before the Father. I believe, help my unbelief. Now some of you have been told that prayer is like, uh, you know, that what do they do in Peter Pan when you, they want a Tinkerbell to show up, right? If you clap hard enough and believe, God will act, right? Anybody heard that? Meaning you need to really believe and you can't have any doubt. You have to clap hard and God will answer. Well, this story doesn't tell us that. This story is of man who is shook with uncertainty and, and unbelief. Oh, I believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, he was helpless. Desperate for his child. Helpless. And Hollisby says, prayer is simply the expression of our helplessness before the Father. Which is hard for Americans to do because we're not helpless. We have technology, we have education, right? And that's probably why we don't pray. In Myanmar, last Sunday, the worship service was led by children. Always around the world you find that. Beautiful children. Two little children whose mother was trafficked to China. They have no idea where she is. She's in one of our safe houses, these two children. Can you imagine that? Leading us in worship. I leaned over to Dick Dickinson, my friend, we're on the platform. I said, Dick, when we get to heaven, we're going to be way in the back of the line. These poor people whose churches are under siege by the government, opposition from Buddhists to militants, and children whose parents are trafficked in that part of the world, children walk five kilometers to school and they're picked off one by one. That's why we have our safe houses that we invest in. Helplessness. And the leader of that worship service, a young girl, said, let's now pray. And that room was filled with 80 people packed like sardines. And my goodness, the volume together in concert, crying out to God, helplessness. And I just knelt there and I said, Lord, I have so much to learn about prayer. Oh, I believe, help my unbelief. And I just think this morning... You know, you feel like you may not be qualified to pray. I'm not spiritual enough. I, I don't have enough faith. I just want to tell you, if you feel helpless this morning, you're a candidate. I'm helpless in facing cancer that I got. I'm helpless in trying to redeem my children. I'm helpless in trying to solve my marriage. I'm helpless in trying to unravel the chaos of my life. If I don't tie my shoe, I'm going to fall off this platform and I'm going to be helpless too. You feel helpless this morning? Then you're a candidate for prayer.